Well, good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Davis. I'm the lead pastor here at uh, the NAS, and we are thrilled to have you with us this morning as we've worshiped. There was a 10-year-old boy whose name was Donnie, who just happened to grow up in a pastor's home. And growing up as a pastor's kid, of course, he had lots of opportunities to hear about Jesus. It just so happened, however, that his mother was also one of those mothers who was terribly worried about germs. Anybody have a mom who was kind of a germaphobe? Some of you might be. And so every time Donnie would come into the house, his mother would remind him, Donnie, your hands are dirty. You got germs on your hands. You need to go wash your hands. Every time he would sneeze or cough, she'd say, Donnie, you need to go wash your hands. That's germs. Every time he sat down for a meal, his mother would say, Donnie, Donnie, you got to wash your hands. There's germs. Well, one day Donnie had seemed to finally have enough of all this, and he replied rather boldly, germs and Jesus, germs and Jesus, that's all I ever hear around this house, and I've never seen either one. (laughs) So welcome to week number one of our newest series on faith. We're calling this series Faith Under Fire. And that's a good title, I suppose, for a lot of reasons, but one is because we're talking about the prophet Elijah, and many of you know his life had to do with some fire. So we're going to look at this well-known prophet of the Old Testament over the next four or five weeks and, and, and just try to get an understanding of what he went through and what God was doing in that process. Now, Elijah is a well-known prophet of the Old Testament, a prophet for maybe somebody who doesn't know. A prophet is simply somebody who God decided to speak through. God has always spoken through people, and back in the day, they called those people prophets. Let me give you a context of the period in which Elijah lived. When he lived during his ministry, if you would, it was about 900 years before the birth of Christ. So 900 BC, give or take. And the northern kingdom had experienced something like 19 consecutive years evil kings. Now let that sink in for just a moment. 19 consecutive evil kings spanning about a 200 year period. Imagine, if you will, not just 19 ineffective leaders, but imagine 19 ineffective evil leaders. This was the time in which Elijah lived. And so we have the king who was on the throne during the time of Elijah, and many of you know this was King Ahab, Ahab. And this evil King Ahab was married to a wonderful lady by the name of Jezebel. Anybody heard that name before? The nastiest lady in scripture. Some people say the most wicked woman who has ever lived. What a reputation. And under their reign, Ahab and Jezebel, the Bible says that Ahab did more evil in the eyes of God than any of those before them. Now, that's really saying something. If you've read your Old Testament, that is quite a statement. So this is a very dark time of corruption. Finally, God says, enough is enough. Interesting, though, God didn't raise up an army to take out Ahab. He didn't raise up some rebellion. Instead, what God did is what God often does. He raised up one person. He raised up one person to take a stand, one guy by the name of Elijah. So today, let's start with an understanding of what The name Elijah means, because you know as well as I do that in the scriptures, it is very common, almost always, a name means something. They don't just come up with something haphazard. It means something. So what does the name Elijah mean? Well, if you're taking notes this morning, very literally, the name Elijah means the Lord is Jehovah. The Lord is Jehovah. My God is Jehovah. Jehovah, the Lord is my God. And so immediately when when God calls this particular prophet, Elijah, to come against the king, by his very name, God is making a statement. A statement to Ahab. He's making testimony. 
The Lord God is the one true God, and the message is Jehovah is condemning and coming against you, Ahab. You better look out. So let's pick up the story. If you've got your Bibles this morning, turn over to 1 Kings chapter 17. That's where we're going to read this story of Elijah and King Ahab. Now, as we begin the story in 1 Kings 17, the thing that you're going to notice is we really don't know anything about Elijah up to this time. We don't know anything about his background. He just appears in scripture in chapter 17 with very little introduction whatsoever. We simply know him where he's from. First Kings chapter 17, let's read verse one. And this is what we find out. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, they will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now you notice this verse kind of starts just kind of giving information. But you also notice about halfway through this verse, if you were watching a movie, the music would have changed. Because we go from just the giving of information to somewhat of an intense moment, a threat, a challenge is given. Because what Elijah did after the introduction was he gave one of the most strategic prophetic judgment against the land that you could ever imagine. He says, for the next months and years, there will be no rain, there will be no dew. In other words, an extreme drought is about to come over the land. Now, to put this in context, when we talk about Years, months without rain in that region at that time, you know, we tend to talk about, you know, a global economic slowdown. You know, we'd have people talking about inflation, inflationary pressures, and all these things that are just kind of making the economy very, very unpredictable. Well, in an agricultural community, in an agricultural uh, economic system that was driven by agriculture, When it didn't rain, things stopped. When it didn't rain, we didn't have a slowdown. We had a shutdown. Something like maybe what we experienced back in, what was it, 2020? We don't like to talk about that anymore. In our world, their shutdown would have been, you cannot find gas at the gas station. The banks not only stop lending money, but you can't get your own money out. You have no electricity at your home. Life as you know it has ended. There will be people starving to death. Unemployment may reach 60, 70, 80 percent. That's our terms of what they were going to face. So Elijah, this man of God, confronts the evil king and he pronounces this coming crisis. And you just have to hand it to Elijah. I mean, you go before the king, you're taking your life into your own hands. You go before the king with bad news, you're asking for trouble. And so there's this sense that Elijah had tremendous faith in delivering this message to Ahab, especially knowing how evil he was. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, Elijah, man, he stepped up to the plate. Elijah, I mean, he stepped out on faith. He did something that required a lot of courage. God is just going to do something incredible with Elijah. I mean, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be fun to watch what Elijah does as this coming judgment comes upon Ahab. But then the music kind of changes again. I'm thinking God's going to do something big now. Elijah's going to kick Ahab right out of the palace. It's going to be wonderful. But instead, God does something a little different. In fact, you could say God did something a lot different, a lot different than I would have ever expected. He takes Elijah into a a season of hiding. He takes Elijah into a series of hiding for quite an extended period of time. We don't know exactly how long, but most scholars think we're talking many months. Look at what it says in verses 2 and 3. After this great condemnation, verse 2, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here and turn eastward and hide in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook I have, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food. 
there. God takes Elijah away. He takes him really out of the game. Why? Because God has a bigger plan for Elijah than Elijah's ready for. There's so much more that God wants to do through him. God's got to shape this man before he can really use this man. You know, I've heard it said before that, that we oftentimes have to go through great hurt before God can use us greatly. You heard that before? Elijah's getting ready to live that. Some of you are going to identify with this. Some of you are going to identify with, with this period of preparation. It looks like it's hopeless, but this period of preparation that Elijah is about to go through. Like I said, many of you have been there. You can look back at your life and see where God took you aside. Where God took you kind of out of the game to prepare you for something that you had no idea was coming. In fact, as we look at this story this morning, I want to point out to you three seasons of preparation that I can see God intentionally doing in the life of Elijah because he's got big plans for him. The first one, if you're taking notes this morning, is God takes Elijah through what you might call a series of painful breaking. <clears throat> painful breaking. Boy, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? But some of you have been in this series in this season. And in this place of painful breaking, Elijah's going to find himself all alone. He's got nobody he can call out to. He's out there hiding and hurting all by himself. Back to verse 3, we just read, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. Do you know what is in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan? Nothing. It is the middle of nowhere. There, there's nobody that lives there. There's, it, it's a desolate, it's an isolated place. There is nothing there. Kareth ravine. Now this word in the Hebrew, Kareth, literally means, if you're taking notes, to cut off. It's exactly what God was doing with Elijah, cutting him off. It means to cut down, which again, I would say is exactly what God was doing with Elijah. He was cut off. He was cut down. He was in the middle of nowhere going through a season of painful breaking. That word literally could be, it, it would be like to chop down a tree. There's no sugarcoating this. It's as if God is going to say, I'm going to take you through a season of breaking. Elijah, I'm going to cut you down. Doesn't seem fair, does it? The man had just gone and proclaimed this, this message and I'm going to cut you down, Elijah. I'm going to humble you. I'm going to teach you to be totally dependent on me. And I'm going to humble you privately so I can use you publicly. I'm going to do something in you that's very, very deep. And so later on, you can be more effective than you ever thought possible. I'm going to take you down privately so I can use you publicly. A lot of you have been through this place. A lot of you can think back to a period or maybe periods in your life that you would definitely call a season of breaking. Painful breaking. Maybe not physically, geographically, but emotionally, spiritually, physically, relationally. You've gone through seasons of painful breaking. You've been through seasons of the Kareth Ravine. There's a season of pain. Where is God? What are we doing here, God? But the reality is God is right there doing a deep, deep work in the midst of that season. There's a little story I love to tell. It's a, it's a story of a little bird, a little bird that was flying south for the winter. So you know this is a true story. But I like how this story goes. In fact, one of the reasons I love this story is it's, it's, it's gross, it's sad, and it's funny all at the same time, okay? 
Three great qualities of a story. So this little bird, he's flying south for the winter, but this little bird got off to a slow start. In fact, he waited too long because the fall was warm and he decided he would just kind of enjoy the north for a little bit longer. But then he decided he better get south, but he didn't get very far and he hit this terrible storm. Oh, it was one of those Michigan spring snowstorms, I'm sure. It was snowing. It was icing. It was sleeting. The wind was cold. And the snow and the sleet was so fierce that it got on this little bird's wings and they started to freeze. Oh, all of a sudden he couldn't fly any longer and that little bird came in for a crash landing. It was not a pretty sight. And that little bird just laid there on the ground. He was being pelted. His wings were frozen. He couldn't fly. And after a period of time, he just resigned himself to a horrible death and said, this is the worst thing ever. And he knew he was going to freeze to death right there. It wasn't long after that, though, that Notice something large moving near him. And he looked up out of that little snow drift that he was sitting in. And on top of him, on top of this little bird, stood a cow. Large cow. A well-fed cow. And that cow plopped on that little bird. That's the only word I can use in here for that, by the way. That cow plopped on that little bird. By the way, if you're wondering, this is the gross part of the story. Okay. Just a load of plop falling on that little frozen bird. And what was going through that little bird's mind was, man, I thought it was bad before. I knew I was going to freeze to death. Now I'm under plop. Now not only I'm going to die, I'm going to die covered in plop. But then slowly over a couple of minutes' time, The warmth of the plop. (laughs) Began to feel kind of good. And his little frozen body began to thaw out. And he started to shake his little wings and he said, I may live, I may survive. And he was so excited by the warmth he began to feel that he began to chirp with joy. Chirp, 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 chirping like crazy. All of a sudden, One of Satan's leading creatures shows up, a cat. (laughs) And this cat showed up, hearing all this racket, this chirping, and the cat was drawn over to the chirping. What in the world is this thing chirping? And so the cat went over to the little bird, which he didn't know was a little bird, and he began to clean the plop off the bird just trying to figure out what it was. And once the cat got him cleaned off, that cat ate that little bird. Now, in case you're wondering, this is the sad part. Three lessons from the story. Lesson number one, whoever plops on you is not necessarily your enemy. Lesson number two, everyone who cleans the plop off of you is not necessarily your friend. And lesson number three, when life gets hard and you get plopped on, keep your big mouth shut. (laughs) By the way, I have an update for you this week. I was driving down the street and a cat ran out in front of me, and I slowed down. You see, there's hope for everybody. Some of you know what that little bird felt like. Some of you would say, man, I've been living in the Kareth Ravine. I mean, I'm I've been there, Pastor. I'm still there. I, I'm, I'm broken. It's least, it feels like I'm being cut down. It feels like you've been plopped on. Here's what you've got to understand. If you're trusting God with your life, what might seem like just bad luck 
what might seem just unfortunate circumstances, can I tell you, if you've trusted your life to God, he's doing a preparatory work right now. A lot of times that preparatory work doesn't feel good, but he's preparing you. God is teaching you something, something that you could not learn any other way. Some of you, you're there. You're in Kareth Ravine. You're in that period. Elijah was there for months. Nobody to talk to. Nobody to lend support. And God was preparing him for something. The second thing we see God taking Elijah through as he's shaping him, molding into a man of power that he would become, is he was taking him through a series, a season of total dependence. Where Elijah cannot depend on anything else. Certainly he can't save himself there. Elijah can't depend on anything but the help that God is providing. Look at verses 4 through 6 again. You will drink from the brook, God says, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he, meaning Elijah, did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So again, we see Elijah, he's all by himself, and God performs this miracle. In the middle of the desert, in the middle of a drought, this stream is running, is providing him water. And then, miracle of miracles, we've got these ravens. Do you realize what a raven is? It's a crow. Do you know what crows eat? Maybe you've noticed alongside the road. They're bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. But what is a miracle is these ravens are actually doing it faithfully. And they're delivering this food right to the prophet. One of the reasons this is especially miraculous is because ravens don't have a very good track record when it comes to parenting. In fact, this species of bird is notorious for neglecting and abandoning their own babies. And yet God calls these ravens to faithfully provide or his prophet. What was God saying? God was distinctly saying, no matter what, Elijah, no matter what, forever and always, Elijah, I'm faithful. I'm faithful. You may be in the valley. You may be cut off, cut down, and alone, but you can count on me to provide for you. Many of you right now are in a season where there has been something you once trusted in that has been taken from you. Maybe you trusted this for your security and it's taken away. And you don't have anything else to trust in but the giver of life and the giver of all good things. And you're at a place where you are learning when everything else that you used to believe in fades away, that God is forever and always faithful to you. There was once a single mom who knew this well. She she prayed every day very loudly in her apartment. She wasn't afraid who heard that God would provide for her, that God would provide exactly what she needed for the day. And this single mom struggled. She didn't have much of anything, but she just happened to live right next door to an atheist. And he just hated, the walls were paper thin. He just hated to hear her pray. She went on and on and on. And through those thin walls, he could hear her praying and and giving thanks to God and her trust in God. And he would yell through the wall, lady, you're a fool. There is no God. Well, this went on and on, and finally one week, there was once again more month left than money. And she was crying out to God, oh God, you've always provided for me. You've always been faithful. I know you'll come through again. Oh God, please provide for my children. The atheist had finally had enough. And so he immediately went to the grocery store. He brought several bags of food, brought it back over to the woman's apartment, put it in front of the door, knocked on the door, and then ran and hid. Well, sure enough, that single mom came out, and she immediately 
began to thank God in heaven for the provision. God, you're so good. Thank you so much. And just then, that atheist neighbor jumped up from around the corner and said, you fool, there is no God. God didn't do that. I did that. And I did it to you to prove there is no God. And then that single mom just began to worship God all the more. She said, thank you, God. You have provided for my needs, and you made the devil pay for it. (laughs) Forever and always, God says, I will be your provider. When you can't depend on what you used to depend on, you can depend on me, and I will give you what you need. And here's the cool thing about this. God didn't give Elijah two days of food or three days of food or seven days of food or a month of food. God gave him what? Enough for the day. In fact, he couldn't even trust God for the whole day because it says the ravens came in the morning and had to trust again they were going to come in the evening. Just enough. Just when he needed it. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there are some people in this room who are learning that lesson even now. You're in a season where you're hurting, where you're alone, and you're afraid. And you know what you're finding? That God is enough for today. You don't have much, but God says, I will be your provision for today. You feel weak, but God says, I will be your strength for the day. You have friends leave you. God says, I will be your friend for the day. Elijah learns to depend on God for the day. That's what God is teaching him. He's breaking him. He's humbling him. He's teaching him complete dependence. And the third thing that God does is God takes him through a season of what I would call unconditional obedience. You know, all these seasons are hard. There's painful breaking. There's total dependence. And then there's unconditional obedience. Look at verses 7 through 10. Sometime later, the brook dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Verse 10. Five words. So he went to Zarephath. Let's just put ourselves in the prophet's shoes for just a minute. It's been months here by the ravine. Oh, the water's been flowing. Those beautiful ravens have been bringing what they've been bringing. Probably not the tastiest, but it's been enough. God has supplied his every need. What's interesting is Elijah had been doing exactly what God said to do. Everything was going well right? But then the brook dries up. In my mind, I'm starting to think, okay, God, where where are you in this? What's the purpose of being here? You gave me water from the brook, and now you take it away. What's up? Did did I do something wrong? And and now you're telling me to leave this place that you brought me. You've been taking care of me. You tell me to to leave this place and move on. Did I miss something? I don't quite understand. I mean, the brook dries up. Why would the source of what's been providing for me dry up? And Elijah is going to learn that the same God who gives water is the God who takes water away. Because often God may cause one brook to dry up, so we'll have the courage to leave where we are and go to where he wants us to go next. 
Does that make any sense? Some of you right now, you may be going, oh, oh no. Some of you might be in full panic this morning. Your brook has dried up. I used to be able to trust in my job. I'm not so sure these days. I used to have this nest egg, you know, preparing for retirement. I had this 401k. Well, lately it's looked more like a 201k. My brook is drying up. I used to be able to trust. I had all these good friends and then things got hard and they just kind of left me. And my friendship brook is drying up. I used to believe I had a good solid marriage, but now it looks like my we're in trouble. My, my marriage brook is drying up. A lot of times people will say, they say, well, you know, where God guides, he provides, right? We say that. I, I believe that. Where God guides, he provides. I used to have that on, on my wall in my office. And you know what he does? He does. Preachers will sometimes say, where there is vision, God gives provision. And I believe that. I believe that. God will often guide by what he provides. But you know what I've come to learn down through the years is with all my heart, I believe that God also guides by what he does not provide. Sometimes that's a lot harder. God, the same God who gives water may cause the brook to dry up to give us the courage to take the step of total obedience he's calling us to take. And here's the thing, because Elijah had learned to trust God even when God takes things away, God did things through Elijah in the coming verses that he could have never imagined. He had to go through the seasons. You see, in, in the way that only God can do, he may end up guiding you by what he does not provide for you. The very thing we want, God may withhold. So we can see the things I couldn't have seen if he gave me what I wanted. Does that make sense? He often guides by what he doesn't provide. The brook dried up. It gave Elijah the courage to be obedient, even when it didn't make sense. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised this morning if there are some people here in this room in a season. Maybe one of the seasons we've talked about this morning. It's a season of deep pain. And God may just say, I'm doing something in you because one day I want to do something greater in you that maybe you'll never see if not for this. Listen, if, if you're in one of those places today, maybe you're hurting, maybe you just need prayer. You might just be at a place, say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would somebody pray for me? Because I've been in this ravine a long time. And it's hard. And I would say, you know, I've been in the ravine too. And it would be my honor to pray that God, through it all, would take you where he wants you to go. Would you stand with me? Kareth Ravine place of being cut down, a season of painful breaking, a season of total dependence, a season of unconditional obedience. Listen, I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what you're going through, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there aren't some folks in this room this morning that have found yourself in a place you do not want to be. It may not have the same name, Kareth Ravine, but it sure feels like it. 
and maybe there's somebody here this morning who just raised their hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Anybody like that? Pastor, would you pray for me? God bless you and you and you and you. Pastor, would you pray for me? God bless you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you because I know what it's like. And it sure helps knowing there's somebody praying for you. Anybody else? God bless you. And you. Bow your heads with me, would you? Father, as we read about the prophet Elijah, we have a lot of questions. But when we look at our own life and we see the seasons that we go through, we, really, we realize that in a lot of ways, we're really no different. Because if you haven't gone through Kareth Ravine yet, let me tell you, one day you will. And the reason I preach a message like this is I don't want you to give up. I want you to know it's coming, and I want you to know that God is faithful. And I want you to know that even in the midst of that pain, that time of painful breaking, that time of learning pri uh, privately so he can use us publicly, through that whole process, there's hope. Through that whole process, there's strength. Through that whole process, there's provision. You can trust God. And so I pray for every person in this room this morning. You knew their hands before they raised them. You knew their problem before they raised their hand. God, you've already been with them. But I pray, God, in these days that there'd be a supernatural strength that comes upon them, that their faith would be increased. God, that they would be able to look at their circumstances and then look at Jesus and have this incredible faith and confidence that he's going to provide. He's going to provide what I need. He's going to use this time in the valley to make me what he wants me to be. And even though it may be a time of painful breaking and a time of learning total dependence and then unconditional obedience, God, if we can learn those lessons, you're going to do incredible things through us. So God, help us to be patient. Help us be faithful in following you. God, give us that, that persistent faith that will not give up, but will endure to the very end. So God, thank you for your word to us today. Thank you for your goodness. I say it one more time. God, you are faithful. As we're dismissed this morning, let me say this blessing over you. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word to him be glory and honor and power forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.